everyone, it's Abigail here. Welcome to the Swiss Helm Park Primitive Methodist Church and the online service. We're praying for you and we hope you enjoy the service. Now as they led him away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon the Cyrenian, who was coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. And a great multitude of the people followed him, and women who also mourned and lamented him. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren wombs that never, never bore, and breasts which never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things in the green wood, what will be done in the dry? There were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and on the other and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots, and the people stood looking on. But even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him coming and offering him a sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Thank you for reading, Nana. Appreciate that very much. And wow, what a what a great uh, spring, or would you call this a summer day today? It's pretty amazing, and it's just to think that uh, I was talking with uh, Reverend Peters the other day, and he had 10 inches of snow in his driveway. And he said, keep talking to me, because that gives me a reason not to have to go out and use the snowblower, and I can blame it on you. So I hung up immediately, and so I don't know if he, if he did anything, but uh, wow, it's, it's been just uh, quite an amazing winter. But we're glad each of you are here today, and, and we pray for God's blessing upon you as uh, we look to his word. Would you please pray with me? Father, we love you and praise you for this opportunity to be together in your house. We ask and pray that you would, uh, you would just have your way in our heart. As your word is before us and as we think of these days that lead up to the crucifixion, we think of the day, Lord, of the resurrection. And we think of all the different things that ensued as a result, Lord, of this. May they bring encouragement and hope to us here today that, Lord, we can be better ambassadors for the kingdom of God, as we ask and pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. So let me ask you this question as we start today. When you see the cross, when you hear about the cross, when you sing about the cross, when you read about the cross, what comes to mind? The crucifixion. What else? Forgiveness. What else? Love, crucifixion, love, forgiveness. What else? Suffering. What else? Hope, absolutely. Anything else when you think of the cross and as you, as you see it there, what comes to mind? Salvation. Salvation. 
Nana read for us today some of the things that went on there that day when Christ was crucified. And in many ways, those same things still, still go on today. And for a few moments as we consider this passage, I, I hope that it can just cause us to, to lock in on some things that pertain to the cross and things that Jesus said in response to what was going on. Because remember, last week as we consider this whole concept of, of, of Lent, it was in Christ we do what? We live, we move, and we have our being. And so all these things that come and stem from Christ and his life and his power and the hope and peace and love that we find through him have their base because of that offering and that sacrifice, that atonement was, that was paid for your sin and for mine. So on that day as they led him, they led him that he would have the cross. They laid him out that he would bear the sins of the world upon the cross. And you think about in verse 34, as, as Nana read, Jesus said, Father, do this. Forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Maybe you could help me advance it today. It's not going to go for me there. Father, forgive them. Forgive them because they really don't know what they're doing. Think about that for a moment. Forgive them. Forgive them. Who's he talking about? John chapter 19, verses 33 and 34. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they didn't break his bones, but what did they do? They 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 didn't do it but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and I, and I got ahead of the reading there but if you go back in 23 verse 24 of 19 it says this when they came and what happened the soldiers they had crucified Christ and took his garments and they made four parts and they said to each soldier a part also a tunic and the tunic was all seen and they said, therefore, themselves, let's not tear it, but let's basically gamble for it. They were gambling for his clothes. Jesus, when he said, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. In Matthew chapter 27, what happens as well when you read the account of the cross? In Matthew 27, verse 44, these things as went on when Christ, even the robbers, who were crucified with him, what did they do? They reviled him. So people are gambling for his clothes. There are people reviling him. When you go up in verse 41, likewise the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and the others. And they said he saved others. Himself he cannot save. For if he's the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will save him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And then in verse 39, those who passed by him blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself if you're the Son of God. Come down from the cross. These very people, as Jesus hung on the cross, what did he say? Father, forgive them. Forgive the thieves, forgive the soldiers, forgive the angry mob for what they're saying, for what they're doing. Forgive them. Think about that. Where would you have been that day? What would you have been doing? When God makes the declaration, forgive them because they don't know what's happening. They don't know what they're doing. And, and, and he says, forgive them. Huh. What was Jesus doing when he said that? In Isaiah chapter 53, he was basically fulfilling prophecy. 
where the word simply says, he bore the sins of many, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 12, he bore the sins of many and made intercession for them. I think about the fact if I was being beaten, if I was having hair pulled out, if I was being spit upon, if I was being mocked, if I was being all these things, how many of us would put up our hand and say, yeah, while you're doing that to me, I'm going to have a prayer for you. Yeah, while you're doing this, I- I'm going to pray for you, and, I- and I'm going to ask that-, that God would forgive you. It's a pretty rough sell. Remember in Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 and 44, in the Beatitudes from that Sermon on the Mount, what did Jesus say about people who are doing all these things to you? Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So today, as we think about the cross and we think about the message that it proclaims and we think about all the things that come in play as a result of that account there that Nana read for us, he's saying, Father, first of all, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Father, these people who are mocking your kingdom, these people who are just doing horrible things to my body, these people who are just making this whole thing such a fraud. I'm going to pray for them. I want to ask that your spirit would speak to them and and cause them to know and understand what the truth really is. Have you ever been persecuted? Have you ever been laughed at? Have you ever been assaulted because of your love for Jesus? Have you been hunted down? Have you ever had a trial? Have you ever been fill in the blanks? The writer of Hebrews says, none of you have resisted to the point of shedding blood. And so this morning, as we think about all these things that come into play when we think about Christ on the cross and those people around him and those people that led him to the cross and all the nature that just fueled this thing, it was of sin. And isn't it amazing the things that happen here in so many ways still happen today? because of individuals who still have the courage to stand for the cause of Christ. Do you realize the persecuted church is still fighting a fight around the world? Where lives are being lost, where people are being dared to stand and proclaim their faith in Christ and putting their life on the line, and martyrdom still is an active thing in the world today. Where are you and I today when it comes to considering all these things. Look at the next slide. Look what happens here. Can anybody identify with that? Who's we? Me, myself, and I? Because nobody else here. You see, when Jesus said, Father, forgive them, because they don't know what they're doing. What was he speaking about? He was speaking about how we get so just immersed and just overcome with darkness and depravity. We we commit and conduct ourselves in a way that's just, in the end, stupid. Forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Think about your life. I'm going to think about my life. And how many times did you do something and enter down some arena, some road, whatever you want to call it, and thought, man, this is the right thing to do. And once you got in there, it's like, how could I have been so blind? How could I have been so deaf? How could I have been so? And you know what the right real point is? Into me. Think about that. 
How could I have been so selfish? How could I have been so vain? How could I have been all these things? Because the reality is, when self is driving us, we do stupid things. Let's face it, the soldiers that day, were they convinced of anything except the lies that the religious leaders had persuaded upon the court there of Pilate to say, this guy's a blasphemer. And Jesus was no different than anybody else they let out to be crucified as they carried out their objective of, of crucifixion because of crimes and penalties brought against the, the order of Rome. So these guys, they were carrying out their objective because this guy, he's not the son of God. He's just some fake imposter who's breached all these things, and they were doing what they do when they crucify somebody. But the people who led that lie and that assault they were so into themselves, they did stupid things. We see eventually as a result of things coming to, to, to understanding, the centurion stands back and says what? Truly, he was the son of God. And depending on who you read and see the, the narrative, I'm going to tell you what, Pilate, I believe, was so touched by the Lord. And what happens with him in the end? Because he held up his hands because he was saying, what is truth? What you people are saying to me is one thing, but what I'm seeing and what I'm experiencing in Christ is something else. And it stopped him in his tracks. What about you? What about me? I've done many stupid things. All under the guise of thinking, man, I know what this is. But when it's driven by the desire of self, pride and the nature of me were no different than what Jesus saw there that day at the cross. Aren't you glad that he forgives? Aren't you glad that he forgets? But think about this. When Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing, did that happen? Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing as they're ripping his beard out, as they're poking at him, as they're hitting him, as they're spitting on him, as they're saying all these things about him. Was all of a sudden they just experiencing what forgiveness is? Think about that. Look at the next slide. Look what happens here. Forgiveness occurs only with what? Repentance and faith. You could say all day, yeah, forgive them, forgive them, but guess what? God doesn't grant forgiveness for our actions until we say I was stupid. I was dumb. I was all these things that were against your kingdom, your plan, your purpose. And by faith in my heart, knowing this is true, I submit myself to you just now. And I want to believe that's what happened with the centurion. And I want to believe that's what happened with countless other peoples that we may not have read about in the scripture, but because of what they experienced and what they saw and what they heard that day, it's at that point when the forgiveness that Christ was calling for from his father was understood by people when they admitted they're wrong. That's a hard thing to do, isn't it? How many of you love to admit you're wrong? I haven't used this analogy in a long time, but remember in the days of happy days, okay, in the epitome of Fonzie, there was a whole episode. Well, Ron got it going there. I was... Yeah, he couldn't say it. Because Ron shattered... Ron. Wrong. <laughs> yeah, Ron played the Fonzie you know, on Happy Days, too. Wrong, wrong, shattered the perception, the persona of the Fonz. Because the Fonz never did what? Nothing wrong. The Fonz was the perfection, was just the persona of what? Coolness. He never stepped out of line. Kids had T-shirts when they grew up. I want to be like the Fonz. You know, all the guys, they went to him looking for dating instruction, looking for all these things. And one day when he was busted, and he had to admit it. But let's face it, we're not far from the Fonz at all. It's hard to admit. And for all the different reasons to say we were wrong. But that's when forgiveness comes. If we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth, that's when forgiveness occurs. And Jesus, though, you're saying, well, why did he say that on the cross? Because he was demonstrated the love and the mercy and the grace that God so freely desires to bestow upon anybody who, what, by faith, would accept this to be true. Could you imagine realizing that there you were in that garrison of soldiers to think that I had part 
and crucifying Jesus. Wow. I thought he was just some thug, some imposter. It was him. True. But you know when we do bad things to Jesus? When we mistreat people, when we fail to feed someone, when we fail to clothe someone, when we fail to visit someone, when we fail to see that one who is the least of these. Jesus, in the word, as he's confronted, what do you mean? We've done all these amazing things. Jesus says, when you haven't done it to those, you've done it to me. And here we come to realize that that day when you can call out by faith and know and understand truly what it means for forgiveness because of a heart that's repenting and by faith reaching out to him. I want to share a couple quick thoughts with you. How would you typically define forgiveness? before I share thoughts. What would, what would your answer be if someone says, what's it mean if you're going to forgive somebody? Anybody want to take a stab at it? Frank. Don't hold a grudge. So if I say, Frank, will you forgive me? You're saying, I'm not going to hold a grudge against you, Dennis. All right, I'm there. Who else? Let it go. Let what go? Oh, okay. Beth's going to come up and, and show us what that means, Okay. Anybody else? Well, in the spirit of Beth's answer, the next slide, I don't know if you realize what's in town this weekend, is is Disney on ice, okay? Disney on ice. And what's the big thing with Disney on ice? Well, many phrases, many terms, but some of the most profound things happen sometimes when you think of Disney. And those three words on the next slide, let it go. Think about it. Just let it go. How many things do we hold on to that just gnarl away at us and remind us and show us basically about us instead of just releasing it? We always think it's about how bad that person was, but the longer you hold on to something, it basically is about you. It's about me. And so this morning for a few moments, when you consider what it means to let it go. The next slide shows us simply this. We're going to release it. And let it go. I remember years back we tried to make one of these with some plastic and some um, chemicals. It was pretty big. And when that thing took off, it lit up quite a few square footage areas of the field and trees. It, it flew, but when it came down after the plastic burnt, the sterno can was still burning to beat the band. And we had to run through woods and high grass and things to get this, to put it out, because it was just going to burn the whole woods down, okay? So we really didn't do it right. But in the spirit of this, it's going to go right. We're going to hold this up and we're going to release it to who? Into the hands of God. Those things that were said to you, those things that were done, that hurt, that disappointment, all those things that we harbor in our hearts. God says, I've let it go. I've dismissed it if you've called on me. I'm not going to hold no grudge, as Frank says. I'm going to, as Beth says, I'm going to let it go. And so these are the things that Jesus, when he was on the cross, and he's looking down at the people who put him there, the people who were mocking him, the people who lied about him, the people who were doing all these crazy things, he was saying to them as well, I'm letting it go. I'm releasing this. I'm trusting and believing that you'll know that it's true. And friends, that's our encouragement today. I can't imagine some battle wounds you have on your body, on your soul, that have marred you, that are on your hard drive. They can't be removed no matter how you tried to do these things. It's there. The Bible says just let it go. 
that release, that dismissal, that's an inferred understanding of what the word forgive means. And so this morning, as we think of Christ on the cross, that's what he's saying to you and to me. The next definition on the slide is simply this. It's God's promise not to count our sins against us. It's pretty sad when you think about sometimes the things that we've done, isn't it? The things that were said. The last couple of days I've been walking part of the sidewalks in McKeesport going up to the hospital. And I think about just the senseless things that have gone on there. And even just the other day, another person was shot. Not long ago, a police officer was shot and killed. And another one shot and wounded. And the senseless things that we do. And, and how it just, it just gripped my heart to think that's happening right here. And then I'm thinking whether it's that or the things that we do because of the sinful nature, it's horrible. But then it makes me think for a moment the power of God that says, I won't hold that against you because of my son who came and gave of himself for you. That's what repentance by faith and forgiveness through Christ means that I'm going to do this. Have you come to that place in your life where you know and understand in your heart because of what Christ has done? Those words that he spoke that day, he says, they don't know what they're doing. Beth had shared something in Sunday school about just behavior patterns of people and what prompts them to a certain place that now all their answer is simply is what? Medication and all these other pills and things to help them deal with life. Where do I go? What do I do? And nothing has changed from the beginning. Nothing has changed from the beginning. We, we get so caught into ourselves because the serpent said to Adam and Eve, did God really say that? Surely you won't die if you do this. And then because of our sinful human nature, what happens? We jump on the stoop train and get a first class ticket and we get at the end it's like we're already at the end of the train did you ever ride the people mover out at the airport think about this that's the stupid train for this illustration and you're all primed and ready to go and they shut the door and guess what it's already at the end of the track it's not going nowhere because that train can go end to end, and guess what? Isn't it sad to think we're all primed and ready, and we get on this thing, and it goes nowhere, and the doors have shut, and we are basically now what? A prisoner. The Bible says that we become a prisoner and, and become a slave to darkness. And here Jesus, because of repentance and faith in Christ at the base of the cross, and find that hope is in him. And he can take that stupidity away from us. He can take that heaviness. He can take that burden. He can take those fears. He can take the anxiety. He can take all those things out of our heart and not count that sin against us no more. He can release it. He can dismiss it. And that was his prayer in earnest as he had that intercessory prayer from the cross over those people that day. And I believe that prayer, that desire is still offered and still in place for us to know and understand who he is and what he can do in our lives. So what happens next? We come to find the forgiveness. We come to find the mercy. We come to find the grace that comes through Christ, those things that Christ gave himself for. But then we're called as well to do something else. We're called to not just hold on to that self and hoard it. But the next slide shows us this in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Read this with me, please. Be kind and compassionate to each another, forgiving each other just in Christ. God has forgiven you. Think about that. 
these things that now I've come to know, I've been called by his word to share with others, no matter who they are, everything, everyone that has breath. Be kind to them. Was Jesus, would he have been justified on the cross to call them all a bunch of losers? Would he have been justified on the cross to say, you don't know what you're messing with? He just could have called the legion of angels and said, forget all this. But on the cross, as he said, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. Friends, you and I in our world every day come across people who don't know what they're doing because of the stupidity of sin. And we are called as believers, first of all, to be what? Kind to them. They may have just spit in your face. They may have just said something so cruel and mean to you. I was talking with a gentleman yesterday, and he was telling me about this group of people who were promoting a Christian agenda. And I said, really, what was it all about? And he begins to tell me some of these things. And he said, it was pretty amazing, but he says, they were almost over the top and in my face. I said, what did they say to you? Well, some things that rubbed me the wrong way. I said, was it true? Yeah. And he's going to go back today and talk to them again. Somebody might push back and say, you're crazy, you're out of your mind, but we're still called to be kind to them and compassionate to them. Show them the love and the mercy of God. And then here's the big one. Forgiving one another. Is there anybody in your life you haven't forgiven yet? Why not? The word of God. Be kind. Be compassionate, be understanding, and forgive one another just as God has forgiven you. This is the requirement for me in my life every day. Because it takes me to the next place where human forgiveness, ready, is a reflection of your experience and understanding of God's forgiveness. Someone will say, you don't understand why I can't. That's a fair statement. But every time that's the statement to justify why we can sidetrack, sidetrack the word of God, we're saying that Christ on the cross wasn't sufficient enough. We're saying what he did fell short in my life because it was greater than what Christ experienced as he was nailed to the cross, as his beard was being pulled, as he was beaten, as he was mocked, as he was reviled, as he was just the center of all this falsehood, and the nature of pure and holiness that day was nailed and was called a fraud. We're saying that doesn't count. But in our lives today, forgiveness, the human forgiveness that we extend to one another is again a mere reflection of our experience and understanding of God's forgiveness in our life. Does that make sense to you? And it's sad in so many ways when Christians, when the church fails at this level of simple understanding of kindness, compassion, and forgiveness. Because if we can't exhibit that, we're saying what we have through God is not sufficient. And can we just go and say this, if that's the case, then we might as well just close the Bible and go home. It doesn't work. If it has limitations that we've established in our mind, then the power of the resurrection that brought Christ from the dead living in us, oh, it's, 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 it's a great literary line, but the reality of it and practical understanding, it's going nowhere. like the person who says they've taken the 350 V8 four barrel carburetor engine and have it turned it into a, a, an engine that will run on water. You talk all day about it. It's not going to happen on pure straight water. There's other things that would have to be done to enhance the combustion process. And so many times we talk about all these things in the world and how the things that are working in our life through Christ, but when we fell just in this component, guess what? We said the whole thing's not working. Look at the next slide, what happens because of love. This is the foundation 
of God's forgiveness of us, the things he forgives us of, and how we can forgive each other. Why did Jesus there endure the cross? The Bible said for love was the reason. He came and demonstrated his love toward us while we were sinners. You see, all these things work, and they're amazing. But the thing that really causes understanding is to know that you're not going to remember it no more, that you're not going to hold a grudge no more. You're going to let it go. You're going to act as though as it never happened. You see, that's God's description when he says that when you ask for forgiveness, it's granted. So why do we hold on to so many things? We expect God to forgive us. But what about to others? Could you imagine that day if you were at the base of the cross in whatever capacity as a religious leader, maybe as a thief nailed to one of the sides, left or right of Christ, one of just the angry mob, one of the soldiers in that garrison, they're assigned to him. And man, you're just stoking that fire. And this guy looks at you and says, I forgive you. What do you do? I forgive you. And you know he means it. Remember the song, and I'm not going to go far with it, Crystal, so rest assured. Now I have a reason for living why I'm forgiven. Jesus keeps giving and giving, giving till my heart overflows. Because I'm forgiven. That weight has been taken off. It's been released. No more to come back. It's been dismissed. The grudge has been removed. The scorecard has been turned over to the fiery furnace, never again to be brought up. And those were the words of Jesus there. As he hung on the cross. What are you hanging on today? What's causing you grief and uncertainty and just angst and you name it? What's causing those things in your life today? Do you have the faith and the courage to look at those things and those people and display the mercy and love of God and say, I forgive you. You might not love me. You might not agree with me. You might not and fill in the blank. But I'm telling you today, I forgive you. And it's not until they come to repentance and faith in their life that that can be of redemptive value for them. But friends, you've released that. And so the last slide we're going to leave you with is simply this, is, is this. First of all, it's a prayer. God, thank you for what? Loving me and forgiving me. Thank you for that. And I'm asking you today to help me to do this to love and forgive others. Stop keeping score. Stop keeping track of all the shortcomings of, of people. Because you know all we do when we do that? We're trying to point out that God and his creation is flawed. No, it's not. Sin is just insane. And we need to see and understand that flesh and blood is the creation of God. The depravity of man has caused us to do crazy things. That's not God's fault. So this morning, we're going to sing a song, and it simply is this. It's a prayer, and it's, Oh, to be like thee. Oh, to be like thee. Blessed Redeemer, pure as thou art. Come in thy sweetness, come in thy fullness. Stamp thine own image deep on my heart. And my prayer this morning is that we can say, God, because of your love and forgiveness for me, I want to be more like Jesus. And if I'm going to be more like Jesus, then I've got to work hard on this part of loving and forgiving others even in the midst of the greatest, most difficult, terrible times of my life. 
because that is the reflection of my experience of what love and forgiveness is with you for the world to see in me. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Father, thank you for loving me when I didn't know what I was doing. Thank you for giving me this privilege to show and demonstrate your love for others so that they would come to know Christ as Savior and Lord. Would you please pray with me? Father, I can't imagine what people have gone through in their life. I can't imagine the way people have treated them, what has been said, what has been done, things that we continue to hold on to, things that we keep, Lord, to bring out of the selective time to leverage our position. But we pray today, as we've heard Christ say, in the midst of all this that was being thrown at him, forgive them, because they don't know. Help us today, Lord, first of all, to know what it means to be forgiven by you. Maybe today's the day we say, Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Maybe today's the day we say, Father, I'm sorry for holding this grudge. I'm sorry for holding on to so long for something that's of no value, that contradicts your word, that causes the reflection, Lord, of what you want your kingdom to be through my life to be marred, to be unclearly seen and known. I'm praying today that I can, by faith, have the same courage, Lord, with others. I can be that ambassador and that messenger for your kingdom. Wherever we find ourselves today, Lord, as we sing in closing, whether it's at the altar, Lord, or at our pew, may this be a time, Lord, as we say, I want to be like you. Loving, forgiving, passionate, Lord. I want to be like you. May it begin just now. As we pray and ask this by faith in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you for joining us. We hope you were blessed by this message. For more information, go to SwissHomeParkPMChurch.com.